we are in a parashat shlach lecha, one of uh, the, my most favorite parashot in the Torah. Not because of the result, rather because of the message. One of the most uh, profound messages that we have in the Torah. Besides the fact that we should all have the desire and take responsibility to fix the damage that uh, was done by the sin of the, of the spies, of the Meraglim. That that is the main sin that, uh, first of all, the sin that was never forgiven, and the main sin that we need to fix. We need to fix idolatry, the, the uh, sin of Adam Arishon, the tree of knowledge, but the sin of the spies is one of the most powerful sins that affected us as a whole, that we need to take responsibility and, uh, and do a tikkun for that. So today I want to share a very important and powerful message that, that has to do with each and every one of us. And uh, before I start the class, I will uh, also take the opportunity to answer uh, publicly because many, many people complain that they're trying to get a hold of me or to ask a question and they can't get through or they want to talk to me or they send a message, there wasn't an answer. So, Baruch Hashem, and that has to do with what I want to uh, start with the class. So I'm taking the opportunity and the stage. But Baruch Hashem, Hashem has uh, uh, brought me in the last few years that uh, the amount of followers has grown from thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. So at this point, it's almost impossible to answer questions. Five years ago, ten years ago, ten years ago, I was able to answer text messages to followers. Five years ago, okay, a little bit less with emails. At this point, it's almost impossible to answer thousands of questions. Thousands of questions are coming every day in through emails, WhatsApps, Facebook, comments. You, how can I answer this? It's impossible to answer. So why am I saying that? Because I try to answer questions through my classes. And many of the answers that we give over is that you can't get a direct answer, but listen to the classes. The answers are all in the classes. You don't have to have a personal conversation. I know many want to have a personal conversation. It's a whole different thing. But if, since it's impossible and I have to accommodate the thousands of listeners and students, then the easiest way to do it is to publicly answer that everybody can hear. With that said, one of the most common questions that I get, and I have the same question myself, is why does Hashem put us in situations with challenges and tests that it seems like I can't even handle? There's no option of even handling it. How am I going to do that? One of the most common questions that I get, and that's why I'm saying it now publicly, it's not about... Uh, uh, to show off I have followers. It's to say that's a common question that I get the most is that the test is too much I can't handle it now, now, uh, What what does the Shem want from me? I can't handle the situation right now. I have no answer. I have no means. I have no way to solve the problem Rabbi help me. What am I? I, I can help you. I Can't help you People turn to me like as if I have a, a, a magic answer. What am I going to pull an answer out of a pocket? I don't have answers. Some people say, I, you, you're the only one that can help me. How can I help you? Mm. What, what am I, who am I to help you? I can maybe give you some guidance, but I don't have the answer. Now don't get it wrong. I also have this question. Sometimes I ask Hashem, what, what do you want me to do? What are you expecting me to do? You have to help out. The test is too much. I, I can't take it. I'm guide, I'm, I have no guidance. I have no, I, no uh, light what to do here. I'm, I'm stuck. I'm clueless. Now what? So, in this week's parasha, and like I told you, it's one of my favorite parashot, not because of the act or the result, rather the message. And of course, uh, uh, we're talking about the act of the spies, the Meraglim. 
What's interesting here is that this parasha is called Parashat HaMeraglim, the parasha of the spies. But you're not going to find the word Meraglim in this parasha. So Meraglim means a spy. So why did it get the name, the parasha of the spies? It doesn't say the word spies, it says Anashim. Or Moshe Rabbeinu uses the word Tarim, tourists. It doesn't say the word Meraglim. So before we start, the question that I present and we'll try to answer, hopefully the message will uh, come across in a clear way, is the question that me and many others ask, where am I getting guidance? How am I getting my, my, my advice what to do? I need, gui I need advice. Go to that rabbi. Like as if the rabbis have answers. Some might do. They might have an extra wisdom. They might have Ruach HaKadosh. But when you go to rabbinical school, they don't give you a manual with answers to problems of people. So we seek ad advice and answers and guidance. So in this week's parasha, we can ask one of the most hardest questions that can be asked in the Torah, asked by many commentaries, and nobody dares to give an answer, because nobody really has a good answer is the question, why is Moshe Rabbeinu allowing the spies to go to Eretz Israel and even endorses it and sends the spies? But Moshe Rabbeinu didn't have Ruach HaKodesh. Moshe Rabbeinu is the greatest prophet that will never be any prophet like Moshe Rabbeinu. He didn't see what's going to come out of that. He didn't know the disaster, the holocaust it's going to bring by approving the spies and sending them and endorsing it? We don't have a good answer. And I'm not the first one who's asking it. Many commentaries dare to ask, some don't even dare. But why is Moshe Rabbeinu sending the spies? But he doesn't trust Hashem. Up until now, Hashem gave 100% guidance, protection. You, this you don't trust Hashem? You have to send spies. A big question here is, how come Moshe Rabbeinu didn't trust Hashem? Hashem told him, I'm going to lead you to the promised land. Wow, well, you don't trust Hashem. Now you don't trust Hashem. Now we have to understand, this is one of the most, if not the most severe sin, the worst sin in our history. It's the only sin that was never forgotten, by the way. Not forgotten, forgiven. The golden calf was forgiven. Many things were forgiven. The Chet HaMeraglim was never forgiven up until today. And needless to say, what a date made. It made a crack in the universe that up until today, this day is a cursed day, Tisha B'Av. That's the day that the spies came back, Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av. Both temples were destroyed on Tisha B'Av. Many horrible happened. Many horrible things happened. And Moshe Rabbeinu has a hand in that? You would think that Moshe Rabbeinu would uh, say, no, 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 guys, we don't need spies. Hashem told us it's all okay. Now, one of the most basic belief, whether it's in Judaism or in other faiths, but mainly in Judaism, is the, is the belief that we trust the words of our, our leaders. And I'm talking about the true leaders, not Bennett. That's not a leader. That, that, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about our spiritual leaders, Moshe Rabbeinu, David HaMelech, and many others. We trust the word of the tzaddik. That's the, the basic belief that the Torah offers to us. And again, it's very important to, to make a difference. A differenti differentiation. When I'm saying leaders, I'm talking about our Torah leaders, our tzaddikim, our righteous leaders, not leaders that we have in the Knesset in other places. If this is the case, and we trust our uh, trustworthy leaders, then Moshe Rabbeinu is the, the leaders of leaders, the teachers of teachers, the rabbis of all rabbis. So we have to trust Moshe Rabbeinu. So how does Moshe Rabbeinu is involved in the conspiracy of sending the spies. This is almost unheard of. So if Moshe Rabbeinu is involved in it, must be something more deeper than just sending a bunch of people to the land of Israel that caused 
one of the worst sins in history. Because technically, one should say, Moshe Rabbeinu should have prevented it with all of his might. No, don't do it. Please, I'm begging you. Don't listen to them. I mean, wasn't there any arguments before that and after that that Moshe Rabbeinu stopped it and prevented it? Moshe Rabbeinu sees with his own eyes the golden calf and he stops the whole, uh, the whole party. Here he doesn't do anything. Okay, so this in itself should raise a red light that if Moshe Rabbeinu is involved, must be that it's a more deeper message that we can just see from some boo-boo or a mistake that Moshe Rabbeinu did. And that's what we want to understand. So understand really what's going on. First of all, a little bit of history. Am Israel, the nation of Israel, goes out of Mitzrayim. They uh, war, walk towards Har Sinai, receive the Torah. And a year and a quarter after leaving Mitzrayim, they already got the Torah. They're marching towards the borders of Eretz Israel. A year and a quarter after leaving Mitzrayim, they stand in front of Eretz Israel in a distance of three-day walk. That's it. They're ready. They're packed. They're excited. They have their visas ready. Everything is ready. Now they see Eretz Israel. Now, interestingly, if you're looking in the parasha, the story starts without a background. The story starts with Shlach Lecha Anashim. Send you for yourself, people. What's the background? Who? Shlach who? Who says that? Who requested the, this uh, a group of people to go? There's no background, there's no information. The parasha starts with, right away, you send the spies. Okay, comes a big question. Who asked to send the spies? It wasn't Moshe Rabbeinu's idea. Well, they made a committee. Okay, so where do we get the information of what really happened? In a few weeks, we're going to finish the book of Bamidbar. We start the book of Dvarim. The book of Dvarim is basically Moshe Rabbeinu standing in front of the nation of Israel and summarizing everything that happened. In the beginning of the book of Dvarim, Moshe Rabbeinu already starts by telling them, you have approached me and asked me. So we don't have information in this week's parasha, but in a few parashot in the book of Dvarim, we do. If you want to find it exactly, it's in the first chapter in the book of Dvarim, chapter 22, when Moshe Rabbeinu says, Vatikrevun elai kulam, and you all approached me. Translation, and all of you approached me asking, we need to send spies. This is a big, uh, pro, uh, a big step. We're going in to conquer the land of Israel. Military-wise, that's the wise thing to do. We're going in as a military. We're not going in as tourists. We need to know. Right? I think it's a good claim. That's when Moshe Rabbeinu should have said, well, <laughs> Spies, shmies. Well, Hashem! Trust Hashem, we have nothing to worry about. We don't need spies. But nevertheless, they approach, they request. Now Moshe Rabbeinu says, okay, let me ask the master of the universe. Okay. Rashi says, why did Moshe Rabbeinu abide the request? Because Moshe Rabbeinu says, if I don't, if I tell them, I don't think we should send spies, it would seem like Moshe Rabbeinu is trying to hide something. And if Moshe Rabbeinu says, oh, you know what? Poor, sure, we'll send spies, basically showing trust in his own product. That's what Rashi says. Like a dealer that uh, uh, you're coming to test out the product, if the dealer is trying to get away with all sorts of excuses. You're saying, whoa, whoa, what is he trying to hide? But the dealer says, sure, take it, you can test it. So I have nothing to hide. So Rashi says on Moshe that he says, I want to show that I trust the product, meaning the land of Israel. Sure, go ahead, you're not going to find anything wrong. On the other hand, that Moshe Rabbeinu says, if I would tell them, don't go in, that that would raise questions. Maybe there's something wrong here. Why is Moshe Rabbeinu trying to uh, uh, prevent us from going in? Maybe we're going to be uh, fooled here. In Hebrew, uh, there's a term. It's called liknot chatul basak, buying a cat in a, in a bag. You don't know what's in the bag. I mean, in Hebrew it works well. In English doesn't. Uh, I'm sure in English there's some term that you... Same thing, buying a cat in a bag. Okay. So Moshe Rabbeinu was afraid 
that maybe they'll think that he's trying to hide something and, and uh, it would look suspicious. So he says, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're not going to find anything wrong there. On the contrary, you'll only find good things. Okay, what is Moshe Rabbeinu showing? Trying, it's called Mafgin Bitachon. Coming with his chest out, showing a lot of trust. Man, you have nothing to worry about. The product is 100% as promised. Okay. Comes a very interesting commentary by the Malbim, who says what I told you in the beginning of the parasha, that says, it doesn't say anywhere in the parasha the word spies. Why are you calling it the, the parasha of the spies? Or cheta meraglim, the sin of the spies. It doesn't say anything about spies. Who says there were spies? Rather, it says in the parasha, anashim, shlach lecha anashim, people. And Moshe Rabbeinu, when he uh, uh, called his people, he called them tarim. Tar, tar means a tourist, somebody who goes and looks around. Doesn't say anywhere the word spy. So the Malbim asks, where did they get the word spies? The answer is that the exact same act was done by Yoshua when he went in to conquer the land. He sent spies. Then it says the word spies. Just the difference is that Yoshua sent two spies and they were actual spies. So the Malbim answers the word spies come from the act of Yoshua, not from the, this uh, parasha. Therefore, we'll see the difference between Yoshua and Moshe, because well, don't forget, Yoshua was one of the 12 men who went into the land of Israel. So what's the difference between the spies of Yoshua and the tourists of Moshe Rabbeinu? Spies, they work as a military uh, mission. They're not uh, independent. When you're sending spies, that's uh, what's called a pulat svait, a military mission. Tourists, no, they're just going to look. To look, to see, to get impressed, or to do what's called public relations. Spies, they're looking what's bad. <laughs> Tourists are looking what's good. You don't have a tourist going to a city and saying, okay, let's find the, the bad restaurants here. I want to find the worst place in the city. Tourists come and they say, no, let's find the best out of the city. So the difference between the spies and the tourists, Yoshua actually sent spies, real spies, to find what's wrong here. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I didn't send spies. I send tourists to go and take nice pictures and to show everybody, look how beautiful it is. You have nothing to worry about. So based on the commentary of the Malbim, Moshe Rabbeinu says, I didn't send any spies. I'm not involved in any conspiracy here. Mapitom, I wanted you to see how good it is and to make a brochure. This is where we're going and everything is great. As Rashi says, Moshe ma'amin baschora. Moshe believes in his own product. He says, I have, I have no doubts. Therefore, I'm sending tourists. I'm not sending spies. Okay. So, we can somehow accept this approach that Moshe Rabbeinu was involved because he didn't want to raise any questions, any doubts. But, <laughs> look at the result. Don't look at the intention. The result was devastating. The result was a, a holocaust. Everybody had to die in the desert. And more than that, what it did for years and years to come. Now, the result was, I mean, when they came back, Hashem got so upset that he wanted to kill everybody. Moshe Rabbeinu uh, uh, spoke on our behalf and says, listen, it's not going to look so good yeah, on CNN, Fox, and NBC. Well, what are the nations are going to say? You took them out of Mitzrayim. You can't bring them into the land of Israel that you promised. You failed, so you had to kill them. <laughs> That's not good for our ratings. You can't kill them. It's not going to look good. It's going to make you look like you weren't able to promise to deliver what you promised. So, instead of the killing everybody, then Hashem says, okay, they're going to have to all die in the desert. And that's the decree was that we were punished to be in the desert for 40 years. And what happened for those 40 years? Every year on Tisha B'Av, 15,000 people will go out to the field, dig graves, sit in the grave all night and never came out of it. 15,000 people every year for 39 years. So if after 39 years, 585,000 people died in the desert as was promised. 
The last year, 15,000 people on the night of Tisha B'Av dig graves in the ground, go and sit, and nothing happened. They all came out of the grave at night in the morning, and they understood, that's it, the curse is over, we're going into the land of Israel, and 40 years in the desert pass. Okay. Now, let's uh, understand, again, the question is, how is Moshe involved in such a conspiracy? So the only one who had the dare to come out and say something was the Ramban, who says clearly, Moshe Chata, Moshe did a sin, end of story, no questions here, don't try to sugarcoat it, don't try to manipulate the commentary, Moshe Rabbeinu sinned, end of story. Deliberately, not deliberately, it doesn't matter. Moshe Rabbeinu failed here. Now, if this is the case, if we take the approach of the Ramban, not Rambam. Rambam is Maimonides. Ramban is Nachmonides. If this is the case, then what was going on in Moshe's mind? You're the leader, right? You're the prophet. What's going on in your mind that you are taking us down that route? It's, it's not clear. It's not only that it's not clear, it doesn't make sense even. Why would Moshe Rabbeinu do such a thing? On top of that will come two more hard questions to answer. The first of all is that Moshe Rabbeinu actually asked Hashem what to do. Hashem was kind of brushing him off, kind of ignoring him, right? And then Hashem didn't give him an answer. Hashem was kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, in Hebrew it says, Lit chamek. Is that, uh, I'm, I'm finding all sorts of, oh, what, well, 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 somebody was calling me? Like, yeah. And nevertheless, still pursue. How? You're asking the master of the universe. We just learned last class, last parasha, that the, a group of men approached Moshe Rabbeinu about Pesach Sheni. Remember the class? And Moshe Rabbeinu says, I don't know the answer. Let me ask Hashem. He goes to Hashem. Hashem answers. He comes back with an answer. What's the difference now? Moshe Rabbeinu turns to Hashem. Hashem is ignoring him. And Moshe Rabbeinu decides to continue. Question number one, doesn't make sense. Question number two, years to come, Yoshua comes to conquer the land, right? If Moshe Rabbeinu failed by sending spies, got punished, and the entire generation got punished, then why is Yoshua doing the exact same thing? Don't you learn from your teacher's mistake? Besides that you were one of the spies? You were one of the 12 men. You come back. You are the servant of the master, Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu gets punished. All the generation gets punished. And you do the exact same thing? Another thing that doesn't make sense. Why are you sending spies, Yeshua? You should have uh, learned from the past mistake and find a different thing to do. Okay, since we presented very hard questions, then the easy answer is to say both Moshe and Yoshua didn't make any mistakes. They didn't make any mistake, it's just us asking hard questions. Okay, so if Moshe Rabbeinu didn't make a mistake, and Yoshua didn't make a mistake, so what's going on here? Now, not only that what's going on here, now it's going to lead us to, what does that got to do with me? After all, I told you not once and not twice, the Torah is not a history book. The Torah is coming to teach me something. Okay. So there's a very uh, clear commentary by the Abarbanel who says, like the Rambam, like the Ramban, Moshe Chata. Moshe did a sin. It doesn't matter right now why, who, what. Moshe Chata. And he gives a back, a source to that. If we go to the book of Devarim, like I told you, when Moshe Rabbeinu stands in front of the nation and tells them what was going on, go to the book of Devarim, chapter 1, verse 37, and Moshe Rabbeinu says clearly, Gambi itanaf Hashem. The Lord was also angry with me because of you. Saying in other words, Moshe Rabbeinu says, I also got punished. Hashem was also angry with me. Saying in other words, that the reason why Moshe Rabbeinu did not go into the land of Israel was not hitting the rock. That was a cover-up. That was not to make Moshe look bad. 
The reason Moshe Rabbeinu did not go into the land of Israel is because of the Chet HaMeraglim. And Moshe Rabbeinu says it himself, it's not commentary. Moshe Rabbeinu says, Gam bi itanaf Hashem. Hashem also was angry with me, I also got punished. Not only you. You didn't go into Eretz Israel, I didn't go into Eretz Israel. And the whole story with the rock, that's just to make Moshe Rabbeinu, just to give some respect and honor. It's not respectful to say the leader, the giver of the Torah. I mean, Hashem gives the Torah, but the one who gave the Torah, uh, you know, we don't want him to go down in history with such a stain. But Moshe Rabbeinu confesses and says on himself, I made a mistake. So now we left with the same answer I asked before. If Moshe Rabbeinu confesses and says, I made a mistake, then why is Yeshua repeating the same problem? We're already getting a confession from Moshe. He says, yes, I made a mistake. I should have put my foot down and says, no, we trust Hashem like we trusted Hashem in every situation. Okay. Now we can come from what I have just said in the last few minutes to the topic of the class, to the what is the message is the Torah trying to tell me with this whole ordeal. This is not a simple message. I'll tell you the words in Hebrew. It's much easier to teach Torah in Hebrew. Then I'll try to explain it for two hours. Avoda bekoach atzmo. The effort, the toiling, the work that needs to be done has to be done with my power. Not with anybody else's power. Now let me explain three words to you that I hope won't take long. The world was created that we should do miracles. Right? The world was created that we should overpower the test and the obstacle and do it ourselves. Not for somebody else to come and set the bed for me and says, here. Shem didn't create the world in a system that he makes miracles. Hashem created the world in a way that you should make the miracle. That your effort should overpower the test and the challenge and I should do it myself. Now how do you do that? You have to look and search for your own power. Just sitting like this and complaining, you're not going to get anywhere. Now, now that we are uh, already on the path of understanding what is the Torah trying to tell me, then let's go back for a second to the question, wh wh why did Moshe do all this? Okay? And again, I'm repeating the question, but it, you have to understand that this is a severe sin that brought disaster on our nation and in the entire world. You would think that specifically in this act, Moshe Rabbeinu will behave different or do something different. Okay. So I'll tell you a little story. I told you not once and not twice, people send me all day long videos. I see maybe one out of 10,000 that, uh, that has been sent to me. All day long people are sending me links, videos, check this out, do this. Most of it is junk, some of it is actually good, and some of it I actually get to see. But Baruch Hashem, there's a lot of uh, videos going out, social media and all that, and Facebook, Facebook, WhatsApp, Bemet, the most of it is junk. And unfortunately, most people all day long watching all these short videos. But there's one video that uh, got my attention. And it's about a certain individual, and maybe you heard his name. His name is Tzvi Hirsch Weinberg. In case you didn't hear the name, he's the head of the OU organization. Maybe not now, but at some point he was the Nasi, the head of the OU organization. And, and you can hear his testimony on, online. It's not that... Uh, that uh, it is a story from a story from a story. He says this, uh, this, this story on a video. And he uh, was, uh, a, first of all, a rabbi. And he's also a professor. And very uh, early in his life, he reached to some uh, uh, crossroads that he didn't know what to do. Should I stay a rabbi and pursue Torah and mitzvot? Should I go down the path of, uh, he's a doctor, a PhD. Maybe I should go that. What should I do? Business, Torah. He didn't know what to do, and which of course caused him a lot of confusion and, and uh, to be uh, unsettled. Okay, he lived in America. He lives in Maryland. 
So at the time, he was seeking advice, like many who like, okay, go talk to some rabbi. So he was seeking an advice from a leader, a rabbi, a tzaddik. So he goes to the Lubavitcher Rebbe in Brooklyn. And uh, he didn't physically go. He called. Now he calls. A secretary answers. And he says, I have a question for the Rebbe. Can I, how can I send the question? He didn't present who he was. He just says, I have a question. So the secretary picks up the phone. It happens to be that the Lubavitch Rebbe picks up the phone simultaneously. So they all hear it at the same time. And the Lubavitch Rebbe tells his secretary, tell him there's a Jew in Maryland called Weinberg. He should ask him. <laughs> he says, but that's me. He tells the secretary, I'm, I'm Weinberg. <laughs> so the secretary turns to the Lubavitch Rebbe and tells him, he's Weinberg. He says, ah, I guess that when you have questions and you want guidance, and you want guidance ask yourself. <laughs> you need to find the solution. Don't call somebody thinking they will give you a solution. Says King David in Tehillim. Don't go in the advice of wicked people. Now it doesn't mean that when you turn to somebody they'll end up being wicked. But David Amelech is telling you, you go in the Etzah of Hashem. Where do you get that advice? Ask yourself. Why are you going and asking people for advice all day long? Rabbi, should I marry him? Should I invest here? Should I do this? Should I do that? What are you asking me? You know how many people stop me on the street? I have a question for you. Do I look to you like Wikipedia? What do you mean you have a question for me? I don't have all the answers. You want to ask me something about the Torah? Maybe I know the answer. A question in Allah. I need to solve your problems? I don't know how to solve your problems. No, you don't understand. You're the only one who can help me. Why are you putting me in this position? I can't help you. I'll give you a blessing. I'll give you some inspiring story. I can't solve your problems. Not me and nobody else. You have to solve your own problems. You know, a person, we were created to grow. We weren't created to stand in one spot. That's why we as humans are called mit a person or an entity, a being that is constantly walking. That's one of the reasons why we're standing straight and not hunched over like most animals. Because we were created to move, to proceed, to grow. Now when do you grow? When there's effort. No effort, no growth. I told you already, not once and not twice. You decide to go into, become in shape, right? You go to the gym. You pay top dollar. If you just sit on the bench like this, you think something is going to happen? No, you need to and push and pull and sweat. And in order to get a result, then you need something that will resist. If you just sit like this on the bench, nothing's going to happen. You're never going to grow if there's not going to be resistance or if there's not going to be any effort. Interestingly, and again, we're stuck with the same question. What is Moshe thinking? What's going on in the mind of Moshe Rabbeinu? So I don't know how to say it correctly in English. I will try. I mean, I think in English they say the, how you see is, is in the hands of the beholder. How do you say it in English? Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Okay, so in English, in Hebrew, there's the same thing is that you hear what you want to hear. Or not what you want necessarily to hear, but every person hears things different. I can tell you one thing. You will hear it as a threat. You will hear it as a blessing. You will hear it as an advice. When Moshe Rabbeinu asks the master of the universe, and Hashem tells him, Shlach lecha, Moshe Rabbeinu hears it completely different than what we hear it. Moshe Rabbeinu says, oh, we matured. Hashem says to me, stop asking me. Do what you think is right. Moshe Rabbeinu is getting it completely different. He says, oh, we can spread our wings and fly by ourselves. 
Moshe Rabbeinu understands, start thinking for yourself. Stop coming to me. Be independent. Why are you coming to advice all the time? I gave you enough advice along the way. I gave you enough, enough education. Do what you understand is the right thing. Moshe Rabbeinu says, great. A great present. We're going into the land of Israel. We're free. You know, if a six-year-old child comes and asks his parents, can I get ice cream? Can I have a few shekels to buy ice cream? Then the parent, of course, here, take. He's glad to give the child. But when a 30-year-old child comes to the parent, can you give me some money? You're 30 years old. Get yourself a job. Do something with your life. Why are you coming to me? You're already mature. Take responsibility. No. How much can I support you? I never heard a, ch a parent coming to their seven-year-old. Come on. I'm supporting you already for six years. Go and work. Moshe Rabbeinu understands. That's it. We matured. We can conquer the land of Israel by ourselves. We don't need even a chef to help us. Moshe Rabbeinu understands we, we can conquer the land of Israel. The land of Israel, of course, is a physical land, but the land of Israel is my own existence. The land of Israel within me. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I can conquer it already. I don't need somebody pushing me from the back, some power that is helping me. Moshe Rabbeinu understands it completely different. Moshe Rabbeinu understands that the destination, the real true purpose of our life is that we have to do the miracle by ourselves. Don't count on the miracle. Don't turn around to Hashem. Now, now what? Now, 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 now. Where are we going? You take charge. You create the miracle. You do what you need to do. Don't wait for miracles or some guidance or some magic word that will solve your problem. Now, where does Moshe Rabbeinu learn this from? You have to understand, Moshe Rabbeinu is light years away from us, that he understands things in a completely different way. So where does Moshe Rabbeinu understand that that's it? Enough to trust Hashem. I mean, of course, we have to trust Hashem in anything. Don't twist my words. But Moshe Rabbeinu says, mature. Take matters into your own hands. With the, uh, uh, the knowledge that Hashem gave you for so many years. Now, where does Moshe Rabbeinu come with such bold advice? So two events happened in the life of Moshe Rabbeinu that caused him to think that. The first event was the sad stories with the tablets, with the first set of tablets. Why? Because Moshe Rabbeinu was called to go up on the mountain and Hashem created the tablets and gave it to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu comes down from the mountain, sees the horrible sight of the golden calf, takes the tablets and smashes them. Now again, there's different commentaries, whether he smashed it, whether they became too heavy because the letters left and they fell down. It doesn't matter right now. The tablets broke. Now, now what happens? Moshe Rabbeinu turns up. What am I going to do? The tablets are broken. Hashem tells him, no problem. Make yourself another set. What? Moshe Rabbeinu sits in his tent. A rock appears in his tent. Just imagine the miraculous act. A rock, a sapphire rock appears in his tent. And Hashem tells him, now, okay, you do a replica. The second set. When Moshe Rabbeinu did the second set, and when he came down from the mountain, what does the Torah uh, describe Moshe Rabbeinu? That his light, his face beamed. Karan or Panav, his face beamed to a point that he had to have like a mask over his face for 40 years. Nobody saw Moshe Rabbeinu's face. Nobody could see his face because it was shining so strong. Only when he went into the tent, then he would lift up his mask. Why? Why in the first tablets, no shining in the face, and the second tablets, the shine? Why? Because the second tablets, he did. The first tablets, Hashem made. And just told him, give it over. 
The second tablet, he did it with his own effort, with his own hands. So the result was that his whole face beamed out of light. That's the first thing that taught Moshe Rabbeinu. The second thing is, is the building of the Mishkan. Now, if you noticed, the creation of the world, how many verses in the Torah we have for the creation of the world? 26 letters. Sorry, 26 verses. The whole creation of the world, something that we can't understand and will never understand, 26 verses is dedicated in the Torah. Corresponding to Yud Kei Vav Kei, right? The letters of Hashem. Matan Torah, the second biggest event in history. A quarter of a parasha. That's it. One of the most shortest parashot in the Torah, parashat Yitro. A quarter of the parasha is dedicated for the giving of the Torah. For building the Mishkan, five parashot. Five portions of the Torah are dedicated for building the Mishkan. I would think that we will have three books of the Torah just for the creation of the world. The Mishkan, it's a tent. What's the common sense here? So the common sense is pretty simple. Building the world was God building us a place to dwell. No big deal. Hashem goes like that. He creates a world. Building the tabernacle, the Mishkan, that's us building a place for Hashem to dwell in this world. That's a big deal. Therefore, the Torah comes and say, gives five parashot for the building of the Mishkan. The answer and the message is simple. Hashem wants us to do it. That's it. That's it. You know, many people ask, how come we don't get miracles like they had in Mitzrayim? I agree with you that you said we do. But many people say, how come we don't see open miracles? How come we don't see a Moshe Rabbeinu now taking us out of exile, going and fighting the Pope, the, the, Pope, the New World Order, going to Paro, eliminating the Erev Rav? How come we don't have that? Well, first of all, wait. <laughs> Second of all, but many people ask, how come we don't have miracles, the sea splitting, food coming from the sky? So first of all, I agree with you. We do have miracles every day. We just might not recognize them. But we live off miracles. But I told you, Hashem wants us to do the miracles. In the beginning, like a child, He says, I'll do some miracles so I can show you it can be done. I will prepare you. I will educate you. But now that's it. You, you, you're good to go. So I'm just going to conclude with a short story in the Talmud. We don't really know if it actually really happened. Many of the stories in the Talmud are metaphorical, just to give over a message, like a parable. But there's a story in the Talmud that there was a man who, uh, he had a boy. His wife was pregnant, gave birth to a boy. And unfortunately, sad news, the wife dies in labor, and the guy is stuck with a newborn baby. He comes home, how am I going to feed this baby? The mother just died, I don't know how to feed. A miracle happened. And uh, he grew breasts. Then he was able to breastfeed the baby. Okay. That's the story in the Talmud. Whether it's a parable or not, it's irrelevant. Now comes a question. The Talmud asks the question, what is, his, what is that person's status? What's the deen of this individual? Comes of Yosef and says, Kama gadola adamaze. How great! is this man that Hashem changed the, the nature and he grew breasts. How He must be the greatest person ever that such a miracle happened to him. Comes Abaye and says, Abcha, how bad, how low is this person that Hashem has to work for him. So the test that Hashem puts us through is only for us to grow. That's it. Hashem doesn't give us a test 
or a challenge or some obstacle in my life to mock me or to push me or to punish me. The test is only for me to spiritually grow. The message is that it has to be done by me. Hashem doesn't want you to go and seek advice from every fortune teller and every fortune cookie or whatever. Seek within yourself and you'll find the best answer. Don't look outwards to find an answer. The answer is within you. Now, that doesn't mean you have to stop asking questions and going to seek advice. But that is done on the way. That is not how you live your life. Some people, every blink, I have to ask my rabbi. I have to ask this. I have to... Oh. That's not what the Torah teaches you. You don't have to put on a pedestal, not your rabbi, not your sensei, not your teacher, not your boss, not your... Shem gives you the answer and he gives you the answer to look within and you will find your own guidance. And you have to understand that you have to put the effort. You have to understand that you can make the miracle. Don't wait for a miracle to happen. Our sage says, Don't count on a miracle. Make an action. You initiate something. You think, okay, I'm in a in a, in a corner, what do I do? Nobody's coming to help you. Nobody's going to come and solve your problems. You have to come up with the answer. You have to come up with a certain action that will cause the miracle to happen. <laughs>